Goed, we will get started. It's, uh, my name is Peter from Dublin, um, a Dark family professor here in the Institute. And it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, our speaker tonight, uh, Dr. Toby Wilkinson, who has travelled here from uh, Istanbul as part of a, a larger and uh, quite a reason uh, trip. But uh, in Istanbul, as you can see here, he holds uh, a postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the University uh, of Istanbul. And he has been there for the last uh, two years. Before that, in 2012, he completed his PhD at the University of Sheffield in Britain, where he worked with uh, Sue Sherrod. And before that, he obtained an MA at uh, UCL in Anthropology, and he, he was an undergraduate at Oxford. Toby's research, and that's obviously what we're here to hear about, focuses on what you could call the Greater Middle East, that is, the whole area, huge reason, between Anatolia and Central Asia. And he's particularly interested in the role played there by material culture, but especially portable material culture. And while well, connectivity would be one way to summarize his research interest there, but immediately, and as you can see on the screen here, the material side has to be added into that. And so a better characterization might be sort of material connections. But the big difference to what several of us, or many of us, uh, are occupied with, this is not about islands, this is not about Mediterranean Sea. All of this is, a, is to do with entirely landlocked uh, contacts between Anatolia into uh, the Asian landmass and connections like the Silk Route and all of that, but obviously much earlier. Toby is thus very much interested in what you could call the bigger picture, and it sort of wouldn't come as a surprise in that sense that he's worked not only with Sue Sherrod, but also with the, her late husband, Andrew Sherrod. And as he has been indeed also been involved in co-editing the Festschriefs uh, and Liber Amicorum for both of them. Toby has actively been involved in fieldwork, primarily in Anatolia. He's worked on the Black Sea on the Cheetah project with Claudia Glatz. And there's, of course, a connection uh, how he's ended up here to speak to us tonight. Um, and um, Toby is currently involved in fieldwork in Didyma. Uh, with his wife Anya, and where he's hoping to add a prehistoric dimension to the classical uh, work that's uh, ongoing there. Uh, as I sort of began to say, he's very much a prehistorian, and as he continues to work on the Central uh, Asia Anatolian connections, he's shifting his attention uh, even earlier into the fifth and fourth millennia. But uh, tonight, uh, his talk is focusing, as you can see here, Southwest Asia, the third millennium, uh, focusing in particular on metallification and metal shock. And so, Toby, over to you. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction, and um, thank you very much for the chance to speak here. It's a great privilege. Um, uh, the talk, uh, the, the focus for this talk uh, today is going to be um, on a series of changes uh, in the assemblages of some, some very distant regions, um, and changes which took place, it seems, over the fourth, more clearly in the third millennium BC, uh, which I believe uh, relate to the international flow of materials, and in particular metals. Um, in uh, Central Asia, uh, they related to the material transitions from the so-called Namazga III to Namazga V periods. And Anatolia, they're associated with the transition from late Cacolithic to early Bronze II periods. And in discussing these transitions, we should try to remember that there's been a great deal of, well, I mean, there still is a great deal of uncertainty around the absolute chronologies of both areas. And most important to emphasize is, is the fact that the chronological terminologies from each of these areas uh, early, middle, and late Bronze Ages, for example, almost certainly do not match. So we should try and remember these differences are purely terminological, and uh, they're not automatically associated with um, relative progress or evolutionary stages, as if there were some kind of unilinear, unilinear path. Um, and I'll try and use absolute dates where possible to make things easier to follow the comparisons between the different regions. So this talk will be divided into five parts. Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction explaining the background to the work. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to then look at the Anatolian material, first Western and then Eastern, which includes Caucasia. Then I'll turn to Central Asia and the material from there. Uh, I want to discuss the concept of metallification. And finally, I want to make some comparisons uh, uh, looking at the um, interdependence between local and global dynamics that this, this evidence highlights. So the background to this talk, I'm sorry for the plug, but this is my uh, recently published PhD project. Uh, and in this project, I was interested in two main fields. So first was looking at ancient trade routes and pr particularly precursors to the Silk Roads and how these might be, might, might be reconstructed from the available evidence. And the second aspect of that was mapping the materials which flowed along these trade routes in order to explain uh, social and economic change. So as part of the project, I developed a GIS model uh, of travel based on what's known as cost distance techniques or friction techniques. And very simply, these models convert ecological variables, data on topography, uh, extremes of temperature, snow or water, into a single hypothetical model of travel cost. And this can be visualized on a map form like this, uh, with the green color uh, showing areas uh, of relatively low cost of travel, and the red uh, color here showing relatively high cost. So what can we do with this kind of model? Well, the most uh, obvious is to highlight uh, potential trade routes and pinch points um, I areas where travel are most likely. So uh, in this particular example, this is um, uh, an object of lapis lazuli, so found in Troy. This is the uh, source of lapis lazuli. And just putting two nodes together and seeing what are the, the possible uh, corridors. Now on these own, these, these, rep these simply represent expected corridors. They're, they're not the actual uh, trajectory of this object. We could imagine all sorts of other things. But when we start to put these things together, um, we can start to talk about the changing densities of travel through time, looking at different materials. So single distributions are also not enough. And these maps become more interesting when one considers multiple categories of evidence together. And it was this process of um, comparing different maps of the wider Near East, which led me to notice the phenomena which I'm going to talk about today, one which seems to connect communities, at least indirectly, which was situated over, uh, well, over 2,000 kilometers apart in some cases. And this phenomena rests on the synergy between uh, ceramics and metallurgy, a relationship which has uh, often been observed, but whose consequences are rarely considered in detail. So let's start this investigation in, in a relatively well-known region, namely Western Anatolia. Uh, the fourth millennium or late Chalcolithic of this area is not very well understood, but we can make out some rough, uh, we can make some rough generalizations. Uh, and we find uh, small villages with uh, starting to experiment with new technologies, including copper metallurgy, uh, intensifying their textile production. Uh, with pottery assemblages which are characterized throughout the fourth millennium by plain, low-quality, handmade vessels. And in comparison to the preceding early Chalcolithic cultures, decoration is very rare. So these dark, burnished, or polished wares are typical. In the subsequent early Bronze I period, this is the third millennium, uh, the quality of the manufacture appears to increase. And the assemblages include increasing number of these small pouring or serving or drinking vessels. Uh, sometime during the subsequent uh, early Bronze II period, so this is the middle to late uh, third millennium, uh, the record shows in, uh, an increasing number of large settlements with monumental buildings, uh, pottery assemblages which continue to be unpainted for the most part, increasing use of grooved and ribbed decorative schemes, shiny black uh, and increasingly red burnished surfaces, a much greater proportion of wheel-made vessels, and from the later EB2 period, certain distinctively shaped vessels, um, such as the Depus vessel here, the angle here is a bit difficult, this thing here, um, Assyrian bottles, the tankards, uh, 
very well known from Troy, but they're found over a very wide distribution from the Aegean to Cilicia to northern Syria. And these, uh, oops, sorry, just go back. these uh, constitute features of an archaeological phenomenon that has been called variously the Anatolian Trade Network by Vasav Shaolu or the Great Caravan Route by Turanafi. I'm afraid the map's been a bit cut off here by PowerPoint, but it does actually go a bit further north in both cases. Um, and most relevant uh, also is the appearance of many metal vessels at this time. So the impressive tombs of al uh, furnish many examples, as do the hordes of Troy. But there are numerous finds of metals from this period, metal vessels from this period. And it's long been suggested these metal vessels seem to represent prototypes for many common EBA 2-3 ceramic forms, uh, to the extent that this, this tendency in the pottery itself has been called a metal shock. And it's tempting to assume, as uh, Georgia Naku has uh, also suggested, that it's, there are actually very many more such metal vessels, and it's simply the uh, pottery vessels are what are giving the clue uh, to this. So these are the better surviving ceramic copies. The question is, uh, why did Anatolian potters appear to start mimicking metal vessels? First rather loosely, it seems, perhaps in the fourth millennium, and then very precisely by the late third millennium. So let's leave this question aside for a minute and turn east uh, to the region of Transcaucasia and eastern Anatolia. Uh, the whole period, uh, from perhaps as early as 4,000 on latest evidence to 2,000 BC, is dominated in much of this area by the so-called Karaz, Kura Arix, or uh, early Transcaucasian phenomenon. This culture is characterized by its very distinctive red-black burnished wares, whose distribution stretches, uh, at least at the greatest extent, from uh, southern Russia, over here in Dagestan, all the way to the southern Levant, uh, from near the Amur Plain, right across to the Iranian Elbots Mountains over here. Uh, core Kura Arak sites have the following characteristics, uh, a low level of spatial complexity, so we don't have towns, um, and we only have these kind of rather conformative uh, villages. And we see si the use of similar kinds of craft innovations to those of the fourth millennium in Western Anatolia, so experimentation with copper and arsenic metallurgy. Uh, the textiles hasn't been studied, which is interesting, but... Um, and likewise, the Eastern Anatolian pottery aesthetic becomes increasingly metallic in form um, through time, so as in West Anatolia. Um, but here there's a particular fascination for this bichrome red-black scheme on the same pots. So inside red, outside black, or vice versa, which perhaps suggests, if this is indeed some kind of mimicry of metals, that Kuraarx vessels were specially polished or tarnished on the inside or outside. And the possible meaning of this uh, aesthetic change uh, towards increasing metal look in pottery really only becomes clear when we compare it to this Western and Central Anatolian material. What could, this, what could the mechanism behind this process be? Is it a uniquely Anatolian experience? Uh, as it happens, no. And perhaps the most dramatic uh, aesthetic change, we can turn to what used to be called Western Turkestan, or in terms of modern boundaries, uh, parts of northeast Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, here, the late fourth and very early uh, third millennium, um, what's known as the late Enolithic or Namazka III period, along the Kopek Dar Mountains, which I'll just show this, this, this thing here. Um, uh, are characterized by uh, relatively large villages with compound houses, uh, native copper metallurgy for jewelry and small tools, and pottery assemblages uh, which are particularly characterized by uh, handmade globular vessels uh, with finely painted, mostly geometric decoration. In the following early Bronze Age, uh, of the Mazga IV, which is starting around 2800 BC, uh, we see uh, several villages expanding into large towns, 
Uh, copper alloys, including lead bronze and arsenic bronze, begin to be produced. Pottery continues to be handmade and painted at the beginning of the period, uh, albeit with different patterns, as you can see. Um, however, the potter's wheel comes to dominate the repertoire by the end of the era, and the proportion of painted pottery reduces substantially. In the following middle bronze, in the Mask of Five, or this is mid to late third millennium, um, this is a period which is often characterized as a time of full-scale urbanism, we see uh, an intensification of settlement with monumental building activity, for example, Alton Tepe, and some people have even rather excitedly described some of the architecture as looking like a ziggurat. I think that's a bit optimistic, but um, uh, most strikingly, of course, uh, is that the new pottery assemblages are completely devoid of any painted, pat uh, any painted patterning. Uh, decoration can only be seen in the form of ribs, grooved lines, and occasionally potter's marks, uh, particularly on the bases. So what are we to make of this ceramic change? What happened to all the painted pottery? Is it simply some kind of arbitrary change in fashion? Uh, now, um, in 1972, Masson and Serenidi, who are the only people I've come across who've commented on this, in fact, um, suggested that the shift to unpainted wares uh, was related to the introduction of the wheel uh, and of urbanism. And simply put, they argue that the reorganization of labor around mass production uh, instead of cottage injury, industries or household production left no time or inclination for painted elaboration. Um, now, obviously, while social organization must be important and labor reorganization is an important factor, I'd prefer to turn this approach on its head so in Namazka five potters were not simply neglecting or forgetting to paint patterns. They were actively making them in new styles with certain desirable forms and colors. And so, as you may have guessed from the previous sections, um, the shiny aesthetic and the particular feature of these pots, the carinated rims, the sharper edges, presence of spouts, suggest to me a skeuomorphic metal source, just as in Anatolia. Now, for the Namazka V period itself, we actually have very few uh, metal finds at all, certainly no metal vessels. Um, but in, this, in the immediately subsequent um, period, the early second millennium, so-called Bactro Margiana Archaeological Complex, it's always a mouthful, um, uh, gold, silver, and pottery shapes uh, from mortuary context <coughs> frequently match exactly. Um, so this, this top one up top one up here is ceramic and here you see a silver version and you see you see all these all these shapes in both metal and in ceramics so this this leaves little doubt in my mind that the rise of plain pottery in central asia is a kind of central asian metal shock in which traditions of this high quality pottery suddenly become dictated almost entirely by metal equivalents and what's curious is that this very dramatic uh, Central Asian metal shock begins more or less at the same time as that intensification of Anatolian metalwares, almost 2,000 kilometers away. So are these local phenomena in some way connected by some global phenomena? Now, um, one way to approach this question is to imagine these metal shocks as a reflection of some part of an underlying process of metal metallification. What exactly do I mean by this? So metallification can be defined as a process by which metals become the primary symbolic token of value to, societies, to a society's economy. In particular, it normally involves the use of one or more types of metal as a simultaneously material yet paradoxically abstract medium of value by which all other things, commodities, services, uh, can be theoretically valued. So where metal equates to money. It's not to say that metal is the only valuable material in circulation, but merely the metal is the, the primary symbol of it. Now in the case of mid-third millennium Mesopotamia, we know from cuneiform text that uh, silver had become just such, an, such a universal measure of value. 
And these records show that all commodities could be costed and therefore exchanged against a certain weight in silver, even if uh, the weight of silver was often a form of virtual accounting tool rather than uh, to allow the reckoning of credits and debts rather than that any actual silver changing hands in particular transactions. Uh, why, why metal as a token of value? Why, why is this in, important at all? Uh, money can also be made from other materials. Um, we know from the ethnographic records, that shells, beads, uh, precious stones, even textiles. Uh, it's obviously quite a complex topic. I don't want to go into detail, but uh, briefly, I think it's worth highlighting uh, one very unique quality of metals, which is its liquidity. Um, which simultaneously facilitates both an anonymity of value. So the life history of objects uh, made from metal um, can be more easily erased. You can melt it down and you can start again and you don't know the story of this metal. The other, abs the other aspect of this liquidity, of course, is the abstraction. So uh, the ability to theoretically divide metal into infinite number of pieces as a continuous measure as opposed to um, qualitative objects. So rather than having discrete, you have 30 textiles. You can do any value of metals. So this allows metals to solve many of the problems of traditional biography-based gift exchange systems and to abstract exchange relationships from other types of social obligations. And this, I think, is one of the reasons why metals is very important to the market economy. So let's turn back to our, metal, uh, to our pottery. A metal shock uh, could be defined as a phase in which pottery assemblages are dominated by a metal aesthetic or direct skeuomorphism of metal objects. And the motivation of skeuomorphism of any kind seems to be drawn on the associations of the mimic material through a kind of sympathetic magic, uh, rather than as some kind of deliberate fake. So people don't think that this is metal, it just it draws on the, the qualities of the metal. And uh, metal shock is the result of a heightened symbolic value and role for metal, and particularly of course of metal vessels, and it's therefore an effect of, and one of the number of possible indications for, metallification and for, an, for a metal economy. And I think it's interesting to look at the pottery assemblages of Mesopotamia in the 4th and 3rd millennium as well. Uh, late Uruk period wares are typically unpainted uh, in contrast to Ubaid and the earlier assemblages. Uh, and we have a few uh, contemporary metal vessels from Mesopotamia, this one from Uruk, rather bashed around. Uh, quite a few more from the Mycop tombs north of the Caucasus. And in fact, uh, at different points in time, we find apparently metallic-inspired pottery appearing in all sorts of places in the southern Levant, so-called metallic wares, uh, in northern Syria and central Anatolia, sometimes also called metallic wares, uh, in southeast Europe, for example, the Baden wares, and in northeast of Iran, so the Hisar wares, so that's this little corner over here. So, uh, why do we see? So, why do we see these very clear instances of metal shock in Central Asia and in Anatolia at roughly the same time? Is it is it coincidence? Now, one scenario suggests that these aesthetic changes in pottery uh, are a direct index of the integration of each region into a metal-driven economy. And uh, the mechanism of this, in this integration would be the fluctuating but exponential growth in demand that urban centres created for metals and the adoption of rituals associated with the consumption of particular substance, perhaps alcohol, or similar symbolically charged substances from metal vessels by uh, different elite groups. So as a scenario, uh, we can see the emergence of an elite practice uh, of drinking alcohol 
uh, from metal vessels in Mesopotamia. At some point, these metals become a physical repository of value uh, in a process of metallification. A leap in the demand for metals, providing potential incentive for metal-rich communities in Anatolia, in Iran, and Central Asia to intensify their own metal-seeking and exchange activities. A growing ascendancy of metals as a physical repository of value in Anatolia and in Central Asia at the beginning of the third millennium. As a result uh, of the increasing contacts, there followed an adoption both in Anatolia and Central Asia of more elaborate practices of uh, wine or special food consumption. And in an attempt to draw on the associations of these elaborate rituals and perhaps to replicate them at a less elite level, potters of both regions began to produce ceramic vessels that mimic these metal vessels. So in this scenario, potential scenario, the apparent synchrony of these events is the result of the uh, parallel expansion of global metal flows both east and west. And we know, of course, uh, from later second millennium, old Assyrian text, that tin was being obtained from east of Assyria. We don't know exactly where, perhaps Iran, perhaps Central Asia. Uh, and alongside Mesopotamian textiles, it was being shipped into central Anatolia in exchange from silver and gold. Again, we don't know where from, but presumably from uh, Western and Central Anatolia, but also perhaps from the Aegean. We, we don't know the exact uh, configuration of the late third millennium metal networks, uh, contemporary with the metal shocks we're describing here, but perhaps they were not dissimilar. And indeed, if we look at the distribution of known sources of silver, copper, and tin uh, today, these, I should perhaps explain a little bit, these. These are uh, effectively proximity diagram. So um, the, it's, it's using that same travel cost uh, map to begin with as a basis. And then you, 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 you see how far away are the sources. So you overlay the sources and you say, how far is it effectively to travel? So even though a, as the crow flies, this is a certain distance across here takes much longer. It's more travel effort to go in this direction. So this is what this is showing. In this case, silver. In this case, tin. In this case, copper. Have I said that right around? Yes. So it seems highly plausible that the uh, pottery metal shocks uh, document the exploitation of Anatolian Aegean sources of silver, perhaps also of copper. And in a sort of mirror image, the, the exploitation of Iranian or Central Asian sources of tin, perhaps also gold, to fuel Mesopotamian demands for metal. And uh, the result for each of these outer or peripheral regions was through a kind of process of contagion, resulting from the pernicious way that the accumulation of metal has on societies who start to deal in large amounts of it. Um, a, a metallification of their economies as well, and, and therefore a subsequent sharpening of this pottery skeuomorphism. But wait, I hear you cry. Isn't this all simply a re reductive reinscription of old fashioned diffusionist theory? A little bit, yes. But <laughs> um, aren't we missing something from the, from the local perspective? So, so far I've drawn on the similarities between Central Asian uh, and Anatolian metal shocks. And in this, this section, I want to tease out some of the differences and, and suggest why this mirror image of metal flows is even possible. Um, <clears throat> I have to apologize here. Some of the, some of, there were supposed to be more diagrams, but some of them were... Um, mangled by PowerPoint when I saved it into a smaller file size, but um, hopefully everything will be clear. Uh, <clears throat> so the distinctive shapes associated 
with the late third millennium metal shock in Anatolia and the Aegean tend to be uh, of relatively small uh, handheld serving drinking and pori vessels. So we have jugs, we have cups and we have plates. Most of these have handles singular or symmetrical of some kind, suggesting that they were held in one hand. Although perhaps, um, for example, in the case of the depas, and that's what I wanted to show, but it's unfortunately not there. You hopefully remember the depas from earlier. It was the red one with the two handles, and you drink it like this. Um, uh, which we presumably passed from person to person, uh, or for sort of downing drinks very quickly without putting them down. So third millennium drinking games. Um, by contrast, the shapes of the late third millennium metal shock uh, in Central Asia uh, and also the subsequent early second millennium uh, developments in Central Asia can be characterized generally by much larger serving sizes. So we have, we have vases, we have raised plates, uh, we have very deep bowls, uh, we have these, um, these pedestaled... Um, cups and plates. This is more of a bowl than a plate, I suppose. Um, but we do have plates as well. Um, spouts are very occasionally present, um, but handles are almost, so, almost completely missing. And this implies that any uh, containing liquid um, would have been drunk with two hands brought to the face or else, and, and this seems more likely to me given the, the larger volumes for most of these things, um, that the vessels would have been displayed centrally and drinks would have been spooned or sucked out of straws or food was picked out from the display. Um, and yeah, this is, <laughs> this is where there would have been a spoon. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the presence of, there are, there are a few metal spoons which you also find in the Central Asian uh, assemblages, would have been here. Um, and so the, the presence of these metal spoons perhaps supports this spooning, uh, the spoon hypothesis. Uh, clearly then, even though uh, both sets of assemblages are metallic looking, the local uh, metal archetypes must have looked rather different, uh, as did, more importantly, the associated rituals of consumption. And for the Aegean and Anatolia, many archaeologists have suggested these new vessels were associated with drinking wine, specifically. Uh, no other kind of alcoholic drink. In Central Asia, it's notable that the grape seeds have also been recorded from Namazga 5 levels at Anau, raising the possibility of a similar expansion of viti and viniculture in uh, Central Asia at the same time as this, met uh, this met metal shock. Residue studies, uh, perhaps more uh, paleobotanic work in both regions might give us some interesting results in this regard. Um, colour repertoire is another major difference. Um, the Central Asian um, uh, Namazka 5 assemblages are for the most part dominated by polished uh, pale cream, uh, sometimes red uh, colours of surfaces whereas the Anatolian early bronze two, three, are generally, um, you see many more darker, burnished, black, dark red surfaces. And this doesn't seem to be simply a matter of the available clays or the available firing technologies because a much greater range of colors are known from both regions and other periods. So this suggests that the potters of this, this era were actively selecting their fabric ingredients and firing styles to produce these idealized color schemes. And it seems plausible to argue that these colors may also reflect the desirable colors of those archetypal metal vessels in each region. So black for tarnished silver, red for copper and for gold, <coughs> brown for arsenic bronze, pale cream for polished silver, or indeed for gold, um, and perhaps tin, tin bronze. And these, these differences are not simply inert preferences. They also have consequences for the rituals and for the economic status of metals in each area. Since, since polishing silver slowly dissolves the metal, um, we can say that Anatolians might be uh, more interested in hoarding of value by preserving the silver, whereas Central Asians perhaps more interested in the sacrifice of value by conspicuous consumption or by destruction. Um, uh, 
just to illustrate it quite starkly, I mean, uh, the, there's a, this classic discussion of the color of silver. Um, in, in a sense, it's irrelevant. They're, they're both. Um, and you have to choose what color you want sil your silver to be. And if you want it to look like this, pretty for the photograph, you leave it for a couple of years, it becomes this color. Um, silver can be black, silver can be white. <coughs> Um, of course, alternatively, Central Asians may have ranked their materials differently, so silver may not have been at the top of the chain. What these uh, distinctions in the nature of uh, metal shock in each region document is, of course, the fact that apparently very similar materials were actually being consumed in rather different ways. And no doubt these differences relate to pre-existing social conditions in some way which values certain rituals, preferred foodstuffs, or perhaps ways of preparing them, or preferred aesthetics. So what would locally be considered beautiful? In other words, long-lived local traditions transcend the adoption of lo uh, global technological innovations. And I think in this context, it's, it's curious to consider that whereas uh, obsidian, which of course is a, is a black, shiny material, was highly valued in uh, across Anatolia, in the Levant, uh, from the Neolithic well into the Bronze Age. It was apparently unknown or unused in Central Asia. So could this be the, the source of uh, the, the, the intercraft or surface color preferences of the metal vessels? So we're seeing a, a chain of aesthetics passing from one material to another. And in eastern Anatolia, the color of Kira Arax vessels, if indeed they do reflect metals, suggests uh, a third way, as it were, um, an internally conflicting but managed economic approach to metal value. So the red-black's color scheme might suggest that the metals, um, perhaps copper or arsenic bronze, are alternatively being polished or tarnished black intentionally. Uh, so one side of the vessel is emphasizing sacrifice and the other side is emphasizing preservation. So just to conclude this, um, these ideas, um, how do we explain the, the, the synchronized metal shocks of Central Asia and Anatolia? So I would still argue that they both document the integration of these regions into a metallic economy, um, which is, and they're thrust into this role due to the massive expansion of metal consumption uh, in the urban centers of Mesopotamia, and perhaps also of Egypt and the Indus. The direct skeuomorphic nature of these vessels shows the desire of middle sections of society to use stand-ins for the expensive metal vessels, uh, which were used by the rich, but which were difficult to access. But the exact nature of this metallic contagion in economic modes appears to have played out very differently in each region as a result of geography and long-lived local uh, traditions. So in effect, we can see a cultural memory being played out um, within different sets of materials um, and being continued over what we tend to think about as important technological eras between the Calcolithic and the Bronze Age. But they continue over a much longer term than our so-called eras. Topographic, clim climatic, and seasonality may have framed the intensity and form of connectivity and provided opportunities for the expansion of these metal flows uh, and long distance interaction uh, through distance and isolation. But it also enabled the preservation of local traditions of aesthetics and beauty, which transcend the effects of uh, global interaction. Um, and since I've got just a couple more minutes left, I just want to take a little uh, detour. <laughs> postscript, um, which seems to confirm these sorts of dynamics between local and global, uh, local traditions and global flows of metals. Um, this detour takes us into the second millennium, across the Eurasian landmass to China. And uh, here, uh, it's generally accepted that the metallurgy was first introduced to Chinese communities by interaction with adjacent communities uh, to the north and west.
who had very large scale, uh, who had very large themselves had very large scale connections and a high degree of mobility across the Eurasian steppe belt. Uh, this is the so-called Andronovo horizon, which you find from over here all the way over here. Um, even if that should be deconstructed. But anyway, that's another story. Um, and perhaps if scholars are right, um, also associated with the widening reach of metal sourcing. So this transfer of skills must have taken place sometime in the very latest third or earlier second millennium BC in Western and Northern China, because the earliest find, metal finds um, appear in early to mid second millennium context in central China. Now, some of the earliest metal vessels uh, whose exact composition is again different from Western tin bronzes in that lead content is normally much higher, perhaps even to a toxic level, um, date to the so-called early to era. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, they are uh, very interesting in that there is a strong correlation, once again, in shapes between bronze and ceramic vessels. Now, this fact is normally glossed as uh, the bronze vessels are mimicking earlier ceramic shapes from the preceding Neolithic period. Um, although we might think about this in a, in, based on the Anatolian evidence in a more complicated way. This is a kind of interaction in both directions. The original surfaces, the surface colours of the bronze vessels are not certain because um, we have this development of these patinas uh, uh, which um, during the course of Chinese history have actually themselves come to acquire, to come to acquire positive value, emphasising antiquity and relationship to the ancestors. So this, we're not sure that this... this the, if you go into a museum, you, you see these Shang bronzes and they're this kind of greenish colour generally. And this, this is something that's been... Um, come to have positive value in later periods. We don't know if that was the original colour, of course. For the moment, though, we might just speculate about the surface colour relationships between the new material of metal and the property and colours of more ancient, valuable material, and one of which continues to hold value in China even today, namely that of jade, um, more often nephrite or jadeite. So here, once again, we may be seeing a local aesthetic tradition transcending the introduction of a new uh, technology and material. So I'd just like to leave it there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a, a wide, even wider ranging uh, tour, uh, with not just sort of uh, the wider Middle East, but sort of all the way uh, to China at the end there. And all along you were touching and um, still playing around it, I think, with quite a few established categories in our political thinking. So I would imagine there may be some questions uh, to be filled in here, so please, so can I, please. Has anybody had much success recovering residue from uh, metal vessels for analysis? Uh, not that I, not that I can think of. I mean, I know they've done some residue value of ceramic vessels from, from, from the Uruk for example. Um, but I can't actually think of any examples of residue from metal vessels. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether, chemically, whether it's possible. It's not something I would... Anybody else know that answer? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, 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 it might have some kind of chemical reaction with metals that could be discerned by, you know, good chemists. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one question is on, I mean, on these Chinese ones in particular, is, is the interaction between the, the wine in the vessels, which are supposed to be drunk, and the, the lead. And it, it seems that they really would be quite toxic if you were drinking wine regularly out of these things. So whether they're really drinking out of them, um, that's a good question. But. So, yeah, residue analysis itself is uh, not really possible with metals, but Sometimes in the corrosion layers and the patina, you will get uh, traces from the burial surroundings. For example, a recent one from uh, Lofkendi in Greece, they found a sulfur product in a tomb that really 
most likely could have been from the decomposing body. So, but it's really broad swaths. Like you wouldn't really be able to, be able to identify much more specific than that. Unless the, the foodstuffs inside were somehow preserved. Metal is not, yeah. How do you ask what you got against uh, metallification as her pernicious, <laughs> her contagion? <laughs> I was just interested by your... Well, I suppose, uh, yeah, it sounds a bit mean to metallification, doesn't it? Um, I suppose what I mean by that is that once you climb on board the metal economy, it's very difficult to go back. So, um, I mean, uh, there is a relationship between um, capitalist economies, market-based economies, and metals in this symbolic sense, I think. And once you're on top, once you're in there, it's very difficult to escape, I think. No, that's, fair. that's what I mean no, by it's pernicious, I suppose. You, someone, you know, put words like that out there, and uh, so good for you, I guess. <laughs> yeah. One in the eye. For... Um, so, do you, can you ever detect uh, skeuomorphy in the other direction? Does does metal ever imitate sort of prestigious ceramics, or does it metal ever? And and the other question is, does the metallification? I mean, is is, is it possible to detect? skeuomorphy in things other than ceramics? So metal skeuomorphy in, in bone or, or, or wood or, I mean, things that would, things that would, you would have less of. I mean, I understand why ceramics is the yes. index, but. Uh, I mean, surely yes. I mean, that, I mean, I think skeuomorphism can work in any direction, right? Um, I think there's something particular about pottery in that it doesn't, you could say it doesn't have a, an aesthetic of its own, so you have to you have to make its aesthetic, and therefore it's it's particular. It's I mean, it's plastic, right? I mean, what's what's the most popular form of skeuomorphic material today? Is plastics, um, and so there's something particular about pottery which makes it more susceptible than perhaps other materials. Right, but, um, but particular examples. I mean. Yeah, I mean, you could you could argue that you know, since ceramic vessels are older than metal vessels in the first place, in some sense. Well, that, that's what I mean. I guess my my, um, my question goes to that point that it, it would be hard to detect in the me, in, in, in the direction, direction of metal because you sort of assume. Yes. Yes. No. I mean, I guess I'm making the assumption that. I like your assumption. You're, you're, yeah, <laughs> you're making, I'm making the assumption that you're going to you're going to emulate the more valuable material. And ceramic is almost never that valuable compared to metal. Correct, but you're, um, you're, you're doing two things at the same time because you're also saying, well, there are these local traditions that, that, that are sort of resilient re regardless of the change to metal. Yes. And so, and so yes. you're, you're saying both things. Yes, but I think, I think that the local traditions are not, they're not material, they're not, they're not material specific. Um, they're, they're, they're local traditions based on what, what do you find beautiful? And so, in, you know, in, this, in, the, in the case of obsidian, obsidian is the beautiful material and therefore that aesthetic is being transferred to metal and therefore is being transferred to pottery later down the line. That's the, if that makes sense. But I mean, I don't know, it could work the other way. I, I remember somebody arguing that there's, there's a, I think it's the Namazgoth, three painted pottery um, and some of these patterns I mean they look like they look like textiles, they look like textiles yeah, yeah, yeah. right they look like carpet yeah. patterns in America in, yeah. the, in American tradition skeuomorphy doesn't often involve metal it involves different types of textiles yeah. and ceramics yeah. and it goes both ways yeah. whereas yeah. yeah and I've heard people argue you know that modern carpets are based on I mean modern you know recent carpets are based on these pottery tradition, which I find very difficult to believe, but you know, you could argue, perhaps, that they came across these shirts and... <laughs> Sorry. I, was, I mean, in the, in the same vein, I was wondering, um, what about skeuomorphism with, uh, with basketry you know, and woven objects or something? Is that like brought into context against uh, the imitation of that and the imitation of these metal vessels? And what sort of context that would take place yeah. in? Yeah, I mean, I, I've basically completely ignored textiles in this particular <laughs> Uh, and baskets and so on in this particular one, but there, there's there, there, 
I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me is that you, you seem to have this kind of um, oscillation between skeuomorphism, which is, tends to be towards textiles and baskets, and then a skeuomorphism that tends to be towards metals. Um, and in some cases, it flicks in different places at the same time to the other one. So it's definitely part of the story, but... Um, well, it seems like that would be involved in um, in that sort sort of whole um, well the whole context and like oh, what I really liked what you were talking about was the the use of color and using the color to sort of represent the value um, that the original objects uh, might have had and how that plays out in the ritual context or habitual context and mm -hmm. what's going on in these uh, in these different uh, places. Mm -hmm. so, Exactly, if I can follow up on that. <laughs> so I, was, I thought your use of color was particularly interesting because color is sort of a weird category in an archaeological sense because like metal, uh, well, metal people, metal studies hardly ever look at color because everyone is, is assumed that so gold is that gold, gold color, silver, silver color, and so on. Whereas in pottery, if people do, pot do color in pottery, they sort of resort to metal charts and you've got these sort of complicated col colors or they don't do it at all because they say, well, so, you know, that's in fact what we've been doing in our ceramic studies. So, you know, it's a byproduct from firing, and particularly when you're dealing non with non fine wires. And then, so it's not, but so the only way to deal with color is in these sort of very broad strokes, as, as you've been doing. And then <coughs> I think would that open the way to more, which you would, it's not secure more prison, but sort of larger product, particularly textiles, how people wear clothing or, or blankets or tents or whatever, that, those sorts of things. That's where you find some prominent colors. And mm -hmm. but is there anything else you could sort of say on, on those lines or on textiles? Yeah, textile colors. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, that becomes yes, harder. <laughs> so, yeah. But you know, so I think yeah, you, know, you, you open up. Yeah, it's interesting <laughs> stuff. You open interesting sort of possible venues, but are very hard. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, well, I mean, one thing that's interesting, perhaps, is that in. I'm not sure whether this fits in with this story or not, really. But I mean, one thing that's interesting is that, of course, in the third millennium, is when we think, of course, it's very difficult to say for certain, is when we think that colour dyes for wool are on the increase in Mesopotamia and they're becoming very popular. And we don't really see that until the sub subsequent period because there aren't enough colour depictions. So, Whether that follows with the idea of local colour traditions of value, I, I'm not sure there's enough for me to say. I mean, no, it's, no, certainly no, it'll be, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting uh, question. I'm sorry, well, I'm just sort of noting it, and I think yeah, it's yeah. really interesting how you use colour, but yeah, so it opens quite a can of worms, yeah. I guess. So yeah. perhaps something more manageable? Uh, no. <laughs> um, so, you know, as you stretch it geographically, I'll stretch it chronologically a bit more. Um, so these changes occur in these communities that you think are, um, I, I quite convincingly propose that they are being drawn into the Mesopotamian, me increasingly metal consuming world of, of urban centres. But the poetry does something different in these urban centres and it keeps doing it from fourth, late fourth, in, through the third and then into the second and also the first millennium. And that's this poetry with a few exceptions of some very elaborate wares like Musi and, 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 and well, the Aegean material that's coming in from the Levant is becoming extremely plain. Um, there's hardly any um, burnishing going on once you once you exit sort of the third millennium. So how does that model does that model also work in some way with the urban centers? Or is it something that the communities that choose to make their pots the way they do um, rather than having specialised craftspeople that may be associated with central institutions, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Uh, can I answer later? No. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, I'm not so sure. I mean, th there are lots of painted potteries as well, I mean, coming up in the... In the I mean, which, which one which, which are you thinking in particular? I mean, are you thinking in... Well, you have the first round of the Uruk period, and then you... And, and, and you, these... So there's sort of a, a swing of the pendulum, really, where you have regions that have aspects of painted traditions set, 
second millennium, early second millennium yeah. Anatolia, with the wavy material, etc., with the with the, uh, the, the, the zoomorphic vessels, etc. It's quite yeah. exuberant, and then it completely dies towards the end of mm. the, the mm. late Bronze Age. Um, the Nuzi is a is an elite kind of ceramic, but the vast majority of material from the region is completely plain as buff. Mm, it mm. looks in color like the ones you showed from the, mm, from mm. the Central Asian area. Yeah, yeah. Um, the heat type material is the same. Yeah. Um, but there are pockets of difference, and those yeah. are the interesting parts, but yeah. places that are associated with urban centers, with states, with empires, tend to go down that route in the third and second. Mm. I mean, I would guess, I mean, I would guess it's something to do with, I mean, I, so to take a particular example with the, the Kira Araks, for example, um, the, it seems to me that the later Kira Araks is, becomes more metallizing precisely at a period when it becomes more like a commodity, I mean, when it, when it spreads. And I wonder whether that could be an aspect of, you know, when these things become more commodities and less so, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, it must be part of the story. Yeah, yeah. yes, please. Um, just a point of clarification. The bronze object on the left of the screen, is that an axe or an adze? And if it were an axe, how would it have been hafted? Uh, not being a Chinese specialist, <laughs> <coughs> um, it was described as an axe. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. 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 I mean, it's, I guess it's about so big or something, huh? It's quite a chunky thing. You probably wouldn't actually <laughs> use it, but. How far but it looks like you should use it this way, right? Yeah. Well, That's what you're saying. Yeah. 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 No, I, they're, they're described as axes, yeah. but. I, uh, I've been thinking, uh, and probably some other people in the room are too, up, up to uh, the Vickers and Gill enormous battle over, you know, metal versus painted pottery and the idea that, is, ex, you know, a vase by Ezekias was a piece of crap, you know, compared to, um, I mean, do you have any sense, you know, how far, you, you did say something at one point about a middle stratum or something, uh, you know, that people are emulating or skewing their ceramics to look like metals. I mean, is this a, who's doing this? I mean, is this just, is it just still a fairly elite band? I don't know the context that you're pulling this stuff out of. Or is it very pervasive? Uh, it's I, absolutely everyone's got this stuff. I think it's quite difficult to tell, to be quite honest, because huh. it, the, the, well, I mean, one of the problems is that um, there's, often this, there's often this circular ceramic dating argument that you know you recognize the fact that I mean you know totally you recognize this is early bronze because of its characteristics um, but perhaps all the you know everyday wear is either you know very boring cooking wear or maybe they're using wood or we, we don't okay. know um, my my guess would be that it's a kind of you know yeah a middle level wear of some kind. Um, like Zekius. Sorry? <laughs> like like Zekius. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's, you know, the yeah. Nouvelle Riche or. That's one. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any other question? Otherwise, I think this is a great point talking about Zekius and other wine drinking <laughs> equipment kind okay. of thing to move on <laughs> to having. A, well, from a plastic cup, still uh, <laughs> more than ourselves a glass. But before we do so, let's thank uh, Toby. Thank you. Thank you.